Good morning. Thank you can find your seat. Dr. Gary Bachman is our next speaker. He is a retired Extension Research Professor of Urban Horticulture. That's uh, growing stuff in the city. Uh, he spent 13 years with the GTE Corporation in Detroit, Michigan and Westminster, South Carolina. He has a BS and MS from Clemson and a PhD from the Ohio State University. And uh, he was previously on the faculty at Tennessee Tech University in Illinois and Illinois State University. He's a retired extension professor. Uh, he's 90% extension, 10% research. He's a former host of the award-winning Mississippi State University Extension Services Southern Gardening TV. Some of y'all may know him from Southern Gardening TV. And um, he was also in newspaper columns and social media outlets. He is a fellow of the American Society for Horticultural Science. He's a great American gardener from the American Horticultural Society. Consumer Horticulture and Master Gardener, Distinguished Achievement Award. Yay, Master Gardeners. American Society for Horticultural Science and the author of his first book, Southern Gardening All Year Long, which is for sale outside the door. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the invite. Um, this is kind of the fun thing that I get to do now that I'm retired, is I can come out and speak to group scale. I can still grow plants without my university overlords looking down on me, you know, making me do reports and meetings and evaluations and things like that. Um, I will tell you, we are recording this. And I'll post this on my social media you know, later this afternoon in case you want to go back. If I went too fast and you need to take notes, um, you can do that. If you've got questions, just fire away. We, we can be very free form with this, or you can make me stay very rigid in what I've got outlined in my head. And I'm going to divert and I'm going to go out and grab it for anyways by myself. So, what I'm going to do um, this morning with you is talk about. The modern victory garden, uh, we've had kind of a resurgence in that term since 2020. And I just, I just want to take a look back at where the victory garden came from, and does everybody really know where it started? I'm going to ask that right now. When did the victory garden, the idea of the victory garden start? Okay, hold that thought. Okay, so we're going to look at victory gardens here. This a little bit. Really, the victory gardens, you know, we have the idea that they started, the term started in World War II. Yeah, I will, I will admit that. In World War II, there were probably 20 million victory gardens that produced 20 million tons of food. Think about that. That means each victory garden was producing a ton of food. You know, Fast forward now, if we have a victory garden, are we going to produce a ton of food? No, primarily because we're not growing on acres. You know, we're growing in square feet. But it was interesting that about 40% of the fresh vegetables in 1943 were coming from victory gardens because everything else was going to the war effort. Now, did you know that the victory gardens have their origins in World War I? World War I because resources were going to Europe. There was the War Garden Commission that was formally established in 1917. They were working on it before that, but 1917 is the date when we got involved with, with uh, World War I. And in 1918, after the, you know, after the armistice, armistice, I didn't say that right, but you know what I mean. You know, you know what I mean. It was suggested that we call these victory to continue this idea of growing at home and calling them victory gardens. It also coincides, you know, kind of ironically with the 1918 flu pandemic. And so there was this big push to grow food at home, uh, that that continues. You know, at the start of COVID in 2020, sorry about that, 
the start of COVID in 2020, March 25th, the New York Times has an article about food insecurity when we're just going into those, those ideas of the lockdowns and having to, how can we start producing more food? I, I just found that, that very interesting just to tie back to the 1918 flu pandemic. So we can look at you know, the interest in gardens. We, we know it's been increasing you know, ever, ever since the, the middle 2000s, really 2008, I put that date there because economic downturn. We, we were doing work at MSU and we were finding that of uh, people that wanted information about gardening, about the median age was 50 years old. And half of the people older than 50 had never gardened before. And all of a sudden they thought they were gonna have to grow their own food for the first time. And so that's kind of where I got involved with this idea of small urban gardening, small urban farms. How, how can we maximize uh, home vegetable production? I'm an ornamental horticulturist. I'm a nursery greenhouse guy. But I take that idea of nursery of growing ornamental plants in a nursery in high density, and how can we move that into vegetable gardening and help in the home gardener to be more successful? That, so that, that's kind of where my, my research effort uh, comes to, or comes from. You know, just some interesting facts from COVID. The National uh, Initiative for Consumer Horticulture is a survey, and it's estimated we gained up to 20 million new gardeners in 2020. And, and why was that? Because people were home, and all of a sudden, they weren't working. They weren't working eight hours a day from home. That garden became that shiny thing. That, that you know, all of a sudden, ooh, there's something else that I can do when I actually should be working. Hey, um, you know, we, we like to put labels on people. All these new gardeners were now called garden aficionados. Uh, because gardening just sounds so mundane. That's about, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I got this new hobby. You want to hear about my new hobby. And as we know, there was one on garden centers. Everybody ran out of seeds, ran out of transplants, ran out of everything. And the idea was, all these new gardeners, well, why don't you just grow more? And the, the growers weren't ready for that. They didn't, nobody knew what was coming. And they, you know, new gardeners just think, well, you just turn the speed dial up on the, on the farm and everything grows faster, like ridges coming out of the family. No, it doesn't work that way. And it took the growers a couple of years to decide, well, is this increase in demand real? Do we invest in square footage? to produce more plants. And yes and no on both, both of those, uh, both of those uh, items. Now when we look at this, this idea of the modern victory garden, I like, I like to use this picture because obviously this is somebody that has worked all day long, still, you know, dressed, and out hoeing the garden or raking the garden in July at five o'clock in the afternoon. Who has time for that? No, I don't, I'm not gonna do that. But we have to get past, you know, jobs outside the home, we have to get past this perceived labor requirement. Yes, the garden, the garden is work, I'm not gonna lie to anybody, but it's enjoyable and you get tomatoes at the end, right? So we can look at that. It doesn't take a lot of time, but the biggest you know, impediment is new gardeners think you need the bat 40 to be productive. You know, if somebody only has a porch or a balcony, you know, or just a small patio, people don't think that you can be successful growing vegetables, and you can. And that's kind of where my ideas of growing a small footprint come from. Now, when, when we get started with new gardeners, Okay, you gotta know the zone. You gotta know what, what you know what plants can grow in your zone. What veggies do you like? Is there any point in growing vegetables that because your neighbor does, but you don't like them? That means you should grow those. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're just gonna grow and, and waste things. And I'm gonna touch on this growing what you like later on. Because I'm gonna show you stuff I like to grow. And that's all I grow. Unless somebody has a real special you know, special, you know, need or something, I'll grow for them. 
what I grew for you guys since for this festival, since this was the annual farming, I grew a bunch of micro tomatoes. I don't know if there's any out there left. This may be the only one left on the property. Um, and there'll be a door prize at the end, okay? So, but let's continue. Do you, do you start from seed or do you go with transplants? What, what do you think? Should a new gardener start from seed? No, because there's a, starting from seed sounds so easy, but that is, it's so hard. And I'm gonna show you the setup I have at home and definitely not a new gardener setup. So transplants are the way to go. Plan your garden, you know, do you grow in ground or do you grow into containers? I'm a container gardener, that's what we're gonna talk about today. I think growing in containers is the best way to go because you control the water, you control the fertilizer, that plant is dependent on you, that means that you have more investment in taking care of the plant. Instead of in the ground, you know, just, oh, whatever, you know, Mother Nature's gonna water it, maybe, right? But I think that's the way to go. And follow the suggested planting dates, and every um, land-grant university, had, their extension has guidelines for your state. Um, what to grow, timing to grow, the bio, what choices to make. So. Now, we're going to talk about Heritage Cottage Urban Nano Farm. When we moved to Mississippi in 2008, it was very close after Katrina, uh, we uh, moved from Illinois, we were invested in the local food scene in Illinois, the farmer's market, uh, CSAs, and the like. So I figured, we're going to move to the coast of Mississippi, there's going to be farmer's markets 12 months out of the year. And it, and it wasn't the case. And so my, my wife and I decided that we were going to start this idea of having a farm at the house. We just have, we just have a normal house, a normal backyard, except my backyard's a circus, and you're going to see a little, little bit of that. <laughs> but but how, how can we convince people that small gardens is a viable enterprise? Uh, we went ahead and we were at the farmer's market 52 weeks out of the year for five years straight, growing out of our backyard. Mostly it was for me to generate the information that I can share that, here's how you do it. And, and I've shared that with, with local growers in Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, LSU, or I guess that would be easy. <laughs> South Carolina, Georgia. But all across the Southeast, I'm sharing this idea of how you can be successful. And what kind of crops you use, you know, the growing strategies, containers, what size plants. I don't I don't grow plants. I don't grow cucumbers or squash that can grow horizontal. It takes up too much space. So I'm gonna give you examples of me growing vertically and, and utilizing the space above pots, which is basically unused space. You know, scheduling, and I, I put scheduling on there only because I told you I'm, I'm a nursery trained guy. So you take a azalea cutting, you put it in a pot, you come back a year later and you sell it. Well, if you're growing vegetables, especially for the market, you're thinking two seasons ahead of time. You know, and for fall crops, you're seeding things, starting things in July and August to have them ready in October. Because if you take kale, or if you like, like kale or mustard, and sow it in October when you get it, February. So it, it was this idea of scheduling things correctly and buying the, the seeds ahead of time. Don't buy them right when you need them. You've got to buy them ahead. You've got to plan ahead. It's something I don't do very well. I tend to fly by the seat of my pants. That was my MO as an extension professional at MSU. It's like, what are we doing today? Let's go do it. Yeah. So, but this this was the setup that we had at, at the market, and it, the market the market was very interesting um, because we grew things that not everybody else grew. For example, a lot of people grew green beans, and they sold green beans for a dollar and a half a pound because that's what the grocery store sold them for. We grew Herico bears, the French green beans, <laughs> and we sold those at nine dollars a pound. That's the kind of that's my mindset when I'm when I'm telling local growers and, and, and homeowners how, how to go ahead. 
The main system I use are earth boxes. I've talked to a couple people here this morning already about earth boxes. It's a sub-irrigated container. It's a commercial product. It's not rocket science. You can, buy, you can find plants for sub-irrigated containers on the internet uh, using you know, rubber-made tubs and things. They're, but those, um, those homemade projects are not UV stabilized. They'll last you two or three years. I have earth boxes that have been outside in my yard for 15 years now, and they look brand new. So, but this this is what I do. You see black plastic, and you're, you're going to see some other, some other things that we do. But if you're interested in sub-irrigated containers, this idea of sub-irrigation, and I'll, let me tell you this right now, just because it has a reservoir in it and there's water in it doesn't mean you only have to water once a week. Okay. Who's, now, are you all master gardeners? How many master gardeners are here? I, I, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, in the heat of the summer, how much water will the one tomato plant transpire from the root system out through the leaves? You didn't know this was going to be like science and stuff, did you? How, 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 how much water? A gallon. An earth box has two gallons of water in there. If you put two tomatoes in there in end of June and July, those two tomatoes will drain that reservoir. So you have to water just as much. The beauty of a sub-irrigated container is it keeps the root zone moisture consistent. And that's what you want. You don't want plants going through dry, wet periods. That's how most people fail in growing vegetables. But, oh, and I, I got off track. I told you I'd do that. This is a publication I wrote for MSU Extension. Um, Sub-irrigated containers for, in this case, Alabama gardeners. And information's all the same, but it's primarily using earth boxes because that's the system that I use. And I, I call growing tomatoes. When, when I talk to new gardeners, first vegetable or fruit, right? We're talking about tomatoes. But the first vegetable they want to grow is tomatoes. So I want to make sure people are successful with that first tomato. And then you got, I'm like that guy in the corner. Then they're hooked. Then the next year they grow three tomatoes. And the next year they grow five tomatoes. And then, then the year after that they start growing the zillions. You know, they, 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 they kind of stay. But, but I, I, I like that term. I think I stole it from somebody, so that's the way that would be. The, 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 the thing about earth boxes, I'm just going to give you a little, little bit of how they work. It's a sub-irrigated container. The key to it is, I call it the shower cap that goes on top. What that does, that controls evaporation from the system. So the only water loss is what the plants transpire. So, like in, in, this, in this configuration, those, those 10 little um, lettuce plants or nine little lettuce plants, that's the only way that system's losing water is by what the water that those plants use. So it's, it's very efficient that way. It also has a drain in it like your um, bathroom sink so you don't overflow it. So even if it rains or you don't put a shower cap on it and it rains on top of it, it will only, the reservoir will only fill so high and the rest of it drains off so you don't have a big soup bowl, which is another problem with that we can get filled with water. When we're talking about fertilization, the fertilizer, I don't know if you can see that red dot, that red dot, but the fertilizer, you don't mix it in the mix. You lay it on top of the mix, and then with that can, the plastic on top of it protects it from the rain. And I mean, I use ag grade like 888, 10, 10, 10, because it's protected from the moisture, it acts like slow-release fertilizer. You have 90 days release out of that aggregate that will release it all if you get it wet. So it's a, it's a, it's a very elegant, elegant system. And it, and it depends how you put the how you put the fertilizer in there. Like for a leafy crop, it can go right down the middle and you plant on both sides of it. For tomatoes, you only put two in a box. I, I, I run the fertilizer strip the short way. No rhyme or reason, I just, I, it's easier for me. But let me tell you a story about number of tomatoes in an earth box. When I first got my first earth box in 2008, I was reading the directions, which is really weird for me. Go ahead and you know, jump in with the directions. It said two tomatoes tops. 
I was a, I've got a PhD in horticulture from the Ohio State University. You're not telling me how many tomatoes to put in this box. I put eight. <laughs> so, so theoretically, I would have to have put eight gallons of water in that failed miserably. I put one, two tops. So I, I have learned I have learned my lesson there. The, the earth boxes are great. Um, if you only have a patio or a porch, they're fantastic. This is me and my dad on the left. My dad's 96 years old, my mom's 95. I have given them, I don't know, they have seven or eight earth boxes out on their back porch. So they can go out and they can piddle in their garden. They don't grow a lot. They don't use the shower gas. My dad is like, that's too much work to do that. Uh, but it gives them the opportunity to garden, you know, without, without getting out to the yard. On the, on the right hand side, this is my friend in Alexandria, Virginia. It's interesting, his house is on the original property of George Washington's Monticello, Monticello, Mount Vernon. Monticello is uh, Jefferson. But Mount Vernon, the original property there. So I, I always I always call him. You know, I tell him, how how things growing on Mount Vernon, you know? <laughs> but but he, he's been growing in these for about 10 years now, great success. I notice that there's irrigation lines running all over the place. Not gonna get into irrigation per se, um, except I have about 10 miles of half inch irrigation pipe running around in my backyard because everything's all automated. Um, it's, it's really the only way to go, I think, to, to keep things consistent because I have 136 earth boxes. I can't walk around every Again, if you're interested in micro-irrigation for the Alabama gardener, I wrote this publication several years ago. It gives you all the tips and tricks on drip irrigation, micro-irrigation, triple irrigation. So it's a little four-page read. It's, it's, actually, it's actually pretty easy. One aspect that I like about you know, growing in these earth boxes is the garden becomes mobile. This is uh, basil I was growing several years ago out in my front drive, my driveway faces west, first part of February. We still get some cold snaps, but I wanna get basil going. So what do we do? Out in front of the garage, when it gets cold, get cold at night, you open the garage door, you slide the garden inside. You can't do that if you're out, you know, out on the back 40. And this is just from earlier this year. I don't, I don't know if sound will work here, but this is me bringing boxes out, tomatoes. Let's, let's see, let's see if it works. Maybe it'll work. No, it won't work, don't worry about that. <laughs> anyway, as you can see that there's boxes back in the garage. They're on wheels. You just, you just wheel the tomatoes out. This was on March 15th of this year. Here's these same tomatoes yesterday morning. Because I was able to provide protection for them you know, when we had that, our second freeze we had in the area, you know, two weeks ago. Uh, but, but, but they've grown about a foot since then because I was, I was able to move them around. And I, I always plant, these are Siberian heirlooms. I always plant, I always sow seed on January 1st. And mid-February planting, I'm looking for tomatoes on my birthday, April 10th. Now, I don't like fresh tomatoes, so don't ask me why I, I, have, I have this fascination with tomatoes. But I always shoot for April 10th. I don't think I'm gonna make it this year. Yeah, just, just stuff happens. But it's some of the capabilities and options you have with, um, with, the, with these earth boxes. You don't have to have a lot of time between crops. This is one year where we have stir fry greens in March. These are the same pots. Here's basil varieties all summer long. And then in November, lettuce. You take one crop out, you refresh the box, boom, you go right back into it with, with, another, with another crop. Um, okay, this, I, I like doing this. This is kind of the, um, the evolution of my garden. This is 2008, five earth boxes in the back. You see I've got ground cloth down because I'm a nursery guy. So you, you know, I've got to have ground cloth down. The first year, we didn't get any tomatoes because the birds got them. And besides, I planted way too many um, plants you know, in, in the earth box. So I came up with this idea the next year. PVC tubing made a little net hut. No birds in it, but what did I, what did I catch? I would catch Katie's barrette in her hair because, <laughs> because the thing was this high. So 
had, had to do something about that. And we came up with the idea that we run bird netting from the side of the house all the way over to our fence, and we make basically a 45 by 25 foot tomato room out on the side of the house. And it, it keeps it keeps the birds out. And okay, now okay, now I've got gravel now. If, if we look a little little uh, later, I've got ground cloth back down, different um, different um, uh, trellising um, ideas that I've used through the years, but. Two years ago, we had a little storm, and it opened up my netting away from the house. And it was open for four days before I, I really realized it, and I went, oh, crap. And so I went out there and had, had to fix it. Well, then, did you know that hornworms, if you take a UV light out, they fluoresce? And so after, after I fixed my netting, I was like, I remember somebody telling me to do that. So I went out to see if I had hornworms, it, it was just a, a few day window. And I found about 12 hornworms. They were all the same size. So it was either one moth or two moths got in there and, and did, all, did all this damage. But that's the, the, um, the hornworms at night. So get yourself a UV light, go out at night. You'll see other things too at night. There. <laughs> but, but the eggs also fluoresce too. And the eggs, they, they, they lay the eggs on top of the leaves. Um, the earth boxes lend themselves to be uh, put on benches. I've got a bad back. I don't like to bend down, so we build we build benches. This was about ten years ago. This picture, all over engineered, you know, you know, um, um, you know outdoor um, wood breaks down. So over the last couple of years, I've been taking taking out my wood benches putting you know, block down. I, you know, I'm, si I'm 68 years old. In 10 years, I'm 78. I'm not going to want to build those benches again. So I'm, t I'm just taking care of things right now. And I think I've, I've got, I've used four pallets of, of concrete block in my backyard. I mean, my yard may be sinking. I, 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 I this is the size of the earth box. Okay, so the question is size of the earth boxes. They're approximately 12 inches tall, 13 inches wide, and 29 inches long. They're like a big window box. They, they hold two cubic feet of potting mix. There, there's no compost in it. You use professional grade potting mix. That, that's all, that's all, that's all you really need. Now, grow the crops you love. I'm looking at the time here. Um, who's going to pull the hook on me if I go over? I just, I just got to go, okay, I got you. Okay. Grow the crops you love. I love to grow peppers. This is um, Tabasco peppers from last year. Oh, and I should say, for another door prize after my talk, this is a dwarf Tabasco plant. It only, it only gets about this big from Avery Island. But I love to grow peppers. Last year, I grew 63 varieties of peppers, only three bell pepper types. I'm fascinated by old genetics. This, this is the university guy coming out of here. So I, I'm, I've been growing peppers last year from Eastern Europe, um, from the American Southwest, down in, down in Mexico and South America, looking for the, for, for, the, for the old genetics and how, you know, a pepper that you know, was selected in you know, Arizona, how does it grow in the humid Gulf Coast region? Why oh, you know, They grow pretty good. They grow, they grow just fine. Um, so this is uh, some that I grew last year. This resin Macedonian from Eastern Europe. I grew that only because you see the the, um, the lines going around it. That's called corking. Peppers, as they as they're growing, the skin is a little tougher than the inside, and if they're expanding too quick from water uptake, the um, the skin's crack. And we see that a lot on jalapenos and poblanos. And generally, you get longitudinal corking. This one, one of the, the, the features on it was radial corking. And that's just, that, to me, is just the cells are dividing in a different direction than, than, the, than the, um, the peppers that have longitudinal. Um, Mellow Star is a, a Shishido hybrid that's a, that's a thicker skin. It's more substantial than Shishido. 
And Mocha Swirl, I think that was from Burpee, one of the commercial companies, but the, but the only stable variegated pepper on the market. And the plants are all different variegations, and the peppers are all different variegations. It was just something that was, that was interesting. And these were my last uh, late season peppers. And I grew a lot of peppers that they feature like on the Food Network and, and the chefs go, and the judges go, ooh, he's pulled out the Fresno peppers. You know? <laughs> they get all excited about that. Now, the Fresno's over on the left hand side. The big long yellow ones are Aki Amarillos. Uh, Bobby Slay likes to use Aki Amarillo paste in what he grows. There's a little short yellow one called Aki Kinchi. Amarillo, which I think is related somehow to, to the big one. And then the little ones, the red ones down on the bottom here are Aleppo peppers. It took me forever to find Aleppo pepper seeds. You can find ground Aleppo peppers, but not, not the seed source. And they're kind of a fruity pepper, not, not very hot. But just, just, have, just have steer peppers that nobody else is growing. It's kind of like a guy thing, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, I got something. <laughs> and then I, then I always show this picture. This is from the uh, 2012 Jackson County Fair Grand Prize Champion, my red bell peppers. So that were grown in an earth box. And every time I get a chance to, tip them, you know, to brag that a little bit, I do that. We grow eggplants, the small eggplants, uh, not, not the big football eggplants. Th these, are, these are much easier to grow, much easier to eat. Um, Various tomatoes, from this, this is from last fall. I mean, we grow a lot of the smaller tomatoes, not many big tomatoes. The big tomatoes we see here, like in the front there, that's black sea, um, and some super sauce there. And I think it's really funny, I was, when I was pulled this picture out, here's all my homegrown tomatoes. What do you see in the upper right-hand corner? <laughs> Cherry tomatoes from the grocery store. Yeah, it's like, geez. But, but these, are, these are some of the favorites that we like to grow. Upper left-hand corner, Patio Sunshine. Upper right-hand corner, Garden Gem. Those are from Proven Winners. They have been very good producers the last several years. Garden Gem is a very fine, heat-tolerant red tomato. Four to six ounce tops. Uh, but, but these are all small tomatoes. Like, um, let's do the seed now. Does anybody speak Spanish? Is that Ciudad? How do you? Cuisad. Okay, what they say. Um, it, it's, it, it was selected in, in Mexico, kind of, kind of um, uh, below Monterey and uh, below McAllen, Texas, in, in that region. Grows very well, real, real small, quickly, to, quick to, uh, to ripen tomatoes. Uh, indigo kumquat, any of the indigo series hybrids are very good tomatoes for us to grow. And orange blossom, this is a tomato, I got the seeds in 2005 when I was at Illinois State University, and it was just a pack of seeds that said orange blossom on them. Grew them, they're pure orange all the way through. Um, there's no orange blossom heirlooms on the market, but I've, I've been growing and saving these seeds now for, well, since 2005. And we, we make sure that we grow these every single year. Um, okra is, is, a, is a good crop. The earth box will grow an okra tree. And I, and I grow these on benches. And so it actually does create a forest over on the side of the house. Um, cucumbers growing vertically. And in 2020, we canned 150 pints of pickles, of dill pickles, off, off of nine earth boxes. Onions, love to grow onions. Kate makes the best French onion soup. You know, and we also like the onions as spring onions, different colors. My daughter Anne gave me seeds. This is Chinese python bean. I can't believe it. And I wanted to grow it just because of the name, you know. <laughs> and she and she says they taste like green beans. Well, if you look at this picture, there's a yardstick next to that bean. That thing's almost 36 inches long. And it, and it gets it gets almost like three inches in diameter. And, and it, they don't taste very good that day. But it has a very interesting flower to it. So there's a little bit of more or, or, ornamental value there too. Yeah, I grow wheat. Yeah, I'd like to tell people I grow biscuits. <laughs> but but you, but think of it. Wheat, it starts off grassy, then it has green flower heads, then it turns golden brown. I mean why not? It's one of the 
and I usually throw this out in the front of my house. And then um, leafy greens, I love the cool season greens. These are um, greens that from my garden yesterday morning, I was out taking pictures. Upper left hand corner is red boar kale, the Mississippi medallion winner, 2006, 2007. Um, right below it is black magic. That's that kind of Toscano kale, the dinosaur kale. They both make great kale chips. Does anybody make kale chips? You should make kale chips. And you'll grow only kale because you won't be able to grow enough kale to make kale chips. They're delicious. Um, lettuces, um, flashy butter jam up on the top right. Um, this is Merlot on the, on the bottom right. And in the middle is Florida giant mustard. The leaves on it are this big. I mean, they are huge. And what else? And it tastes like French's mustard, like right out of the. I don't know how it does that, but, but it's really, really good. And then if you're growing you know, in a um, nano farm, small farm, why not grow microgreens? Um, I started growing microgreens in 2009. as kind of a, what other kind of value-added crops could I grow for the local market? We were the only local grower of microgreens on the Mississippi coast in 2009. And since then, We've helped, I don't know, there's five or six right along the Mississippi coast that are growing commercially now and, and making money at it, which is the whole idea of the thing. But microgreens are, are basically just the seedlings of any kind of cold crop or leafy vegetable or herb. You grow them for seven days, 21 days, and then you cut them off and eat them. Um, it kind of, kind of makes meals a little fancy, like going out to a fancy restaurant. These kind of things. But they're colorful and they taste just like their big grown up cousins. And there's, there's all different kinds that you, that you can do. Upper left, that's cilantro. And we had restaurant customers that wanted the, you can see the seed hit, the seed holes are still on there because there's another pop of flavor there. Because what are cilantro seeds? What do you make out of that? Oh, coriander. So all of a sudden there's cilantro flavor and coriander flavor. It's kind of like a twofer. Um, just, just a mix of greens, different colors, and then radishes down on the on the bottom shelf, and really see the different colors of the stems, which is really the, the, the whole the whole um, selling part of this: white, red, um, white, purple, red, and green. And then this was my setup. This was when we were growing for the market. I had four baker's racks of microgreens going in our in our dining room. <laughs> and I love my wife, okay, because it was her idea. I was growing out on the back porch, ambient temperatures going up and down, and humidity, and she says, you know, Gary, it's just the two of us, and we don't use the dining room. Within five minutes, I had, I had racks in that dining room chair. But we, but we, had, um, but we had four racks going at, at, going at one time. I was afraid the cops would go by and, you know, put the heat gun on the house, and I'm sure that side of the house was below. <laughs> if you want more information on microgreens, here's another couple publications I wrote. Microgreens for the Alabama Gardener, okay? Uh, and varieties get you started. And then what do you do with the harvest once, you, once you've been so successful in growing all this, all this food, what do you do with it? Well, you learn to preserve it, right? And so that's one thing that, that we do. We, we are canning fanatics. I do all the water bath canning of the vegetables that we can water bath. Kate does the pressure canning. And we also pressure can protein too. And saving it because you can chicken or you can pork or you can beef. What is it? It's shelf stable. You lose it. We might get a storm every now and then, and you lose power for a time. The freezer only lasts so long unless you're on a generator. So what do you do? We were transitioning from freezer to more shelf-stable options. And this is our zombie apocalypse stash. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and, I, and I tell folks, because I, I, I'll show this picture and somebody will say, well, when the zombies come, I want to come to your house. I said, I'll just wait till I send you the secret knock because not everybody's going to get it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of what we do. 
I found out from a lady in Florida, Leah Brooks, she's a uh, arrow garden fanatic, and she dehydrates veggies. And so I started dehydrating the, uh, tomatoes. And if you dehydrate tomatoes and grind them up, one quart jar of dehydrated ground up tomatoes equals eight jar, eight quarts canned. So you're reducing the space you need. And then to rehydrate it, if you want paste, it's one part tomato, one part water. You want sauce, it's one part tomato, two parts water. If you want juice for a Bloody Mary or something, it's one part tomato, maybe three or four parts vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I dehydrate peppers because I'm, I'm, making, I'm grinding and making my own pepper mixes. Play, playing around with, with things like that. So I had fun with that. I've got two um, Excalibur 9, nine nitrate dehydrators. And then I'm going to kind of get ending up here. And we need to think of, from if we're thinking of Victory Garden, thinking of the garden as community. You know, how can the garden help build community in our, in our, in our neighborhoods? Well, we have the first little free garden in the state of Mississippi. It's like the idea of little free library except we're growing things for our neighbors to come by and get. And this was, our, this was the first one. We're number 146. The, the movement started in Fargo, North Dakota, Morehead, Minnesota. Um, and that's our, that was our first box. It was two foot by four foot and we had a cedar. So we're not feeding the, we're not feeding the cubs. But what happened? I posted it on Facebook and somebody over at WLOX saw that and said, oh, we're going to come out to can you come take me into a story on this? And I'm like, it's only two foot by four foot. <laughs> and it was raining like heck. It was, it was like Hurricane Day. I think it was a storm coming in. Going to landfall later that night. And they're out here shooting this little, you know, I'm like, don't you guys got something else to do here? <laughs> but we did this out in the rain. Um, we expanded it to, we had three two foot by four foot boxes out front. We ended up with a salad table out front. This is all for our neighbors. This is all just extras for the neighbors. Uh, well, no matter what they tell you about cedar, cedar does not last forever. <laughs> so last year I had to go ahead and replace, and I forgot I had this in here. People would come to our door asking for plastic bags <laughs> to harvest the stuff that we're growing for them. <laughs> so we had scissors and bags, and every once in a while there'd be loose change in there, like we got a tip or something. So, <laughs> But we went ahead and started redoing, and we went with the the steel uh, fire pits, fire rings. And Kate calls those our crop circles now. <laughs> and this year we've added two of the long um, trough type planters. This, this was taken yesterday morning also um, out, out in the yard. And one thing I wanted to show you here, see these yellow flowers? We grew rapini there last year, and it's seeded. And anything that comes up and flowers in my yard stays wherever it's at. And so we do that, and people have been harvesting the rapini that's actually growing in the lawn. But that, that's, that's something fun, fun that we do for, for the neighbors. And neighbors just come by and, and pick what they want. We had a neighbor that moved away, and she would send a note to Kate. I'm sending my flying monkeys over to get, I'm sending the kids over to get. It was actually a fun thing. And then the last thing that we do for our neighbors, because we, we grow just as much now as we did when we were going to the farmer's market, um, except when we preserve all that we can that we can do, I, I give away to the neighbors. And if you know what it means when the Krispy Kreme, the hot light is on in the window, <laughs> you know that's the time to get the going. So we had this gray sign that we put, just put out front, put a table out there, Neighbors know it's fresh veggies. You better get down there because somebody else is going to beat you to them. But yeah, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, whatever, whatever we have, we just, we just put out there and let, let the let the neighbors enjoy that. So let's see where, where are we where are we at here. Okay, if you want to connect on social media, I've been called like I'm a teenage girl on Facebook. I, I've been kind of referred to as that. Um, Go to Gary Groves at Heritage Cottage. That's everything plant, everything farm that we're doing. Uh, and, and Instagram is Gary Groves. We're going to have our, our, uh, our 
our web page is going to be up here in the next few weeks, and so it'll be gary-bros.com, and there'll be, there'll be more and more information. But you can find everything we do, all the pictures, all the videos that we do. During COVID, Kate and I started doing daily videos. I know some of you have commented if you've watched our videos before. And it was just me in the garden giving you gardeners tips on, 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 how, on how to survive you know, staying at home the whole time. And I was just blown away by it. But we had over 350,000 views of just me gardening in the backyard. So it, it was fun. We still do. We don't do as many now because you know, there's just other stuff going on now. But we, we do two or three a week. Um, I've got copies of my new book out in the, in, the, in, the, in the lobby there. I'm really proud of this. It's not a compilation of 400 plants you must grow in your garden if you want to be successful. It is a compilation of the more than 600 newspaper articles that I've written about plants through the year just to give you inspiration and give you ideas about what, what we can grow. Yes, is it geared for you know Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana area? Yeah. But you want to know something? I have people that are up in Indiana and Ohio that have bought the book because they say, you know, we can grow these same plants up here. Yeah, more, more of a summertime plant. And you know, it's arranged by months. All we have to do is shift like six weeks and, and you're right in line with our with our with our growing. It's also been described as a chat across the backyard fence, you know, just two gardeners talking. So it's 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 fun. I'm, I'm really happy. It's been awarded uh, some recognition nationally by the National Association of County Ag Agents, American Society for Horticultural Science, and Southern Region of ASHS too. So that that, that has been a fun thing. Now, a, just a fun little idea I had. I had coffee mugs. Uh, I, I was uh, I got my death wish uh, thermos here, but I've collected death wish mugs for years. And I thought I really like urban nano farm mugs. So, right, so we've got some mugs out there. If anybody's interested in a, in a coffee mug from the nano farm, and I thought just to leave it um, with, with kind of this thought: you know, growing your own food is like printing your own money. <laughs> and I, 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 I kind of, I kind of live and grow by that by that model. So with that, thanks for having me. I'll ask it, I'll answer any questions. I'll ask you questions too.